I think it's safe to say that for all of us, the change and crisis in our world right now feels like it's constantly outpacing our ability to adapt and cope like a wildfire sweeping through, changing the very landscape around us. I find it helpful to remember that fire, with all of its destructive power, also brings with it new hope and opportunity. Visit a woodland scarred by fire even a year later, and what you'll find is new plant and animal communities springing up in the open spaces where sunlight now can reach the soil. This is the gift of life the miracle of God, the ability to form bonds in the harshest of environments. I have a passion for helping people grow in their walk with God and with each other. Over the last 10 years, I've developed a set of resources for empowering pastors and local church leaders to make space for an intentional discipleship process in their church communities. Deep Calling is a discipleship movement. Discipleship and disciple making that emphasize a lifelong process, not a destination. It's about teaching how to see God in the everyday, learning how to listen to God's voice, discovering who we are and how we can make a difference in the world. The Deep Calling book includes biblical foundations for discipleship and specific steps that churches and leaders can take in order to implement an effective discipleship model in the local church. The Deep Calling curriculum offers the leader a complete guide to facilitate a discipleship process with teaching notes that equip you to lead two day-long retreats and 10 sessions, hands-on experiences to use during those sessions, and lessons that are ready for virtual, in-person, or hybrid delivery. The Deep Calling Journal gives space for each participant to grow during the journey. This is a journey of growth in relationship with Jesus through understanding the eight calls of God. Devotion, prayer, rest, community, healing, witness, service, and blessing. God desires something deeper for you and your community. Walking together with Jesus, growing in depth of relationship through knowing and being known, joining Jesus in the mission of God in this world. What does it look like to live into the closeness of the arrival of God? Perhaps the very challenges we're facing right now are part of an invitation to the truly breathtaking discipleship journey with God. Perhaps you're being invited to a mission an adventure to bring healing and hope to those around you. You are being invited to answer the deep call of God and invite others to do the same. Tara Vincross serves as the senior pastor of Azure Hills Church in Grand Terrace, California, where she lives with her husband, Caleb, and their incredible kids, Josiah and Ava. Pastor Vincross was raised in the Seattle, Washington area, and over the last 20 years has served churches in Washington, Pennsylvania, and California. She is passionate about helping people create space in their lives to become deeply rooted in the love of God. Please welcome Pastor Tara Vincross. Hello, I'm so glad that I get to be with you and spend this time together. My name is Tara Van Cross, and I'm the senior pastor of Azure Hills Church in Southern California. This is my husband, Caleb. We have been married 17 years last month, and our two kids, Josiah, age six, and Ava, who's two and a half, both welcomed into our family through adoption. We're so grateful for how God has led in the formation of our family and how God led us to serve here at this church, an incredible church community and pastoral staff. As I've been praying for you, I've been praying and God has just been saying, ask, ask for this. And I said, what are you wanting me to ask for? God invited me to ask for the Holy Spirit. You see, there's a section in scripture where it says that you who are parents know how to give good gifts to your kids, and God also wants to give good gifts to us. He says the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift God can give. 
So would you join me in prayer as we ask God for the greatest gift that we can have? Oh God, thank you for this time. Would you pour out your Holy Spirit over us? Myself and those who are listening right now, those who are longing to gather, but who are still connected in this way as we gather together from our homes and our offices. God, would you pour out your Spirit anointing us, comforting us, renewing us, giving us courage and hope. And God, would you anoint us for service in this world? We are so grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Statistics are important. They let us know where we are, just like you have to know your weight or your blood pressure or your current grade before you can see improvement in that area of your life. The same is true in the church. We need to know where we're at in order to allow it to inform us with where we're going. My topic is return home, reclaiming those who have left. And the truth is people are leaving. Don't tune out the statistics for a moment. Stay tuned in. Pause for a moment to hear. This is from the October 8, 2020 report, the statistical report given at the annual council for the whole general conference that gathers. Dr. David Trim shared this. Since 1965, we have recorded baptisms, profession of faith, and losses. So in that time, since 1965, 40,421,554 people have joined the Adventist church. Amen, right? Amen. And in that same period of time, 16,240,069 members have chosen to leave. That means 40.1% have left. We are increasing in losses while we're seeing a decrease in accessions. Now, accessions are those who join by baptism and profession of faith. Those are often the most reliable numbers, as Dr. Trim shares, because people report baptism and profession of faith. Those are the headlines, those are the things we get to celebrate. So even though all the losses might not be recorded, the baptisms and profession of faiths are. So what we're seeing is we might have more people than we had before, but they are less effective in sharing Jesus than we were before. In one sense, this isn't anything new. In Matthew 25, 55 through 56, it says, Jesus, as he faced his most challenging hour, had all the disciples leave him. All deserted him and fled, the scripture says. All of the disciples left Jesus, all of them, but all but one returned back to him. We can imagine Jesus who is there when people started leaving him during his ministry. And he says, are you leaving too? And the disciples said, to whom would we go? Where would we go? You have the very words of life. So we find true in this instance, that even though they all deserted them, they all returned. Why was that? Because they had found life in Jesus. They had experienced Jesus. They had been discipled. They had been mentored. They knew they were loved and saved by God, and they knew that God had called them to a purpose. I will cause you to fish for people. I will show you what it looks like to live into this purpose. Jesus knew something that we don't always practice, that discipleship is a long game. Discipleship is a lifelong journey. That means each disciple will have periods where we feel really alive and periods where we feel dead. Times of high faith and times of devastating doubt. This does not disqualify the disciple. Oh, if our members knew this does not disqualify you because you face doubts or because you face challenges. There are always seasons to the spiritual journey. In Psalm 1, it says that the tree planted by the streams of water has deep roots in Jesus and bears fruit in season. There are times for fruit, and there are other times when you sink those roots down deeper. Those things that we see are evidences of what have always been true. This has always been true from the beginning, that we are dependent on Jesus. We don't do the work ourselves. The disciples then and the disciples now had to realize that the hard way. We don't do the work ourselves. 
Some members, especially those who have children who have grown up and who have left the church, have said they know the truth. They were raised in our schools. They went to church here each week. So I'm hoping when the time comes, they will return. When they see the signs, I know that they know. I'm hoping and praying that too. This leads me to the question though, what are they experiencing while they're here with us? What do we want to give them while they are here? In order to come back, there must be something to return to. The disciples all left, they all deserted Jesus, but they came back because they had an experience with Jesus. What was the experience like of those adult children who were raised in the church? I'm sure it varies, but I'm hoping that they experienced a holistic discipleship approach. I'm hoping that the children that are being raised in our church right now are experiencing a discipleship approach that encompasses the whole of their lives. I'm so impassioned about discipleship because God has changed my life through this journey. God has transformed me and I want others to experience the same. You see, holistic discipleship is about knowing, being, and doing. We do a lot of focusing on the knowing. We do a lot of focusing on the head knowledge, but we also need the being, how this is incorporated into who we are as people, and the doing, the action, the purpose that we're called to in the world. We need the head, we need the heart, and we need hands in the world. Think about your discipleship for a moment. Think about in your churches. And I've been surprised that sometimes even things that I thought were focused on heart or on hands end up being about the head. We do really good at knowing at Bible studies and even teaching spiritual disciplines or spiritual habits or practices that can become about knowing those things about the head. But are we inviting people to have a heart experience with Jesus? to be God's hands in the world. I believe the disciples had head and heart and hands, and so they returned to Jesus even after they deserted him. They left, but they came back. You see, in our lives, there must be a pouring in and a pouring out. Many times, if we're just learning and memorizing things, and we haven't internalized it, or maybe we are internalizing it in our heart, we're experiencing the love of God. If we don't have the overflow in our lives where we are the hands, we are doing the work of God in the world, we're missing something. There's a whole generation of young people who are like, uh, you can just have that. Pray, read your Bible. I'm gonna do the work in the world. I'm gonna show up in love. I'm gonna make a difference but we've disconnected things that were never meant to be torn apart. It's the scriptures and praying that leads me to showing up in greater love in the world. You see, I'm able to love God and love others in a different way than I could on my own as I spend time with God in the scriptures and in prayer. It emboldens me for action in the world. Social justice and the gospel are never meant to be separated. The gospel, the good news, leads me to both the service and the proclamation work of God in the world. Now this is what it means to disciple. We're called to accept the person. We're called to embrace that they're on this journey. You see, the father, with the story of the prodigal son, saw his son was on a journey. And he asked for his inheritance. He asked for, for what he thought he was entitled to. But he didn't let it stop him, his rudeness, the way that he was approaching him. He released him to go on a journey. For some of us, we need to entrust our kids to God and release them to go on the journey, their own journey, because God has his hand over them. Two things that I would hope as they're being released for their own journey, two things that I would hope that all disciples of Jesus, all of our members would know. First of all, God loves you. God delights in you. God favors you. And secondly, God has called you to a purpose. God has a plan for your life. Who you are, your personality, your story, your way of relating to life is something that communicate the love of God to the world. 
You can communicate that in ways that no one else can. I think if, if our disciples knew those two very things, God loves you passionately and God has placed a call on your life. That would make all the difference. That's what the disciples experienced. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. You see, we do acceptance and love or we do purpose, but we need both. Acceptance and love and purpose. Remember, too, that it's not just the prodigals who leave the building. It's those who are left behind, but who have left in mind and heart, who also need to be recaptured in their passion for discipleship. As you disciple, living the mission that you've been called to, you will also re-engage those whose bodies haven't left, but who've left in heart and in mind. In John 21, 1 through 25, there is this a scene that takes place after the resurrection of Jesus. Now remember, G Peter started off, he started off so confident. All else will betray you, God, but I will never deny you, Jesus. And then you know what happened, right? He denied Jesus three times and he heard that rooster crow and he locked eyes with Jesus. But this moment on the beach is a moment that Peter needed in order to be the person that God had called him to be. He needed that departure. He needed deserting Jesus. He needed the time where he left, but he also needed this reinstatement. You see, Peter had denied Jesus three times and on the beach, Jesus asked him, do you love me? Three times. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. And what's Jesus' answer? Feed my lambs. Do you love me? You know I love you. Shepherd my sheep. Do you love me? And Peter's finally like, Jesus, you know everything. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter says, only you know. I thought I knew me, but I, I realize you know me better than I know me. He had to get to the point where he was dependent, trusting God more than he trusted himself and the feelings that he had. But Jesus, each time, issued a call to mission in Peter's life. Do you love me? Then there's this connection with joining what I'm doing in the world. And God has placed a call on your life. It's not only that we need love, we need purpose. Even in his denial, even as he walked away, Peter's place in the kingdom didn't change. The call of God on his life didn't change. We need to let those who have left, who've walked away from God, know that God's plans didn't stop for them. God's plans didn't stop. God's call on their life, God's love for them didn't ever go away. God never stopped loving them or having a purpose for their life, and we need to let them know. You see, my own father, my dad, was one of those who returned. He wasn't raised in an Adventist home or a Christian home, but when he was in his mid-20s, he was stationed in Germany, and while he was there, he met an Adventist family, and they invited him to eat at their table and to join their Bible study. And in the time he was there, he got to know them and got close to them, and when he departed to return back to the United States, they gave him a Bible. And they talked to him about Walla Walla College and Adventist College on the other side. See, my dad was raised on West, in Western Washington. And they talked to him about Walla Walla College. So my dad left and he went there for a year. Even though it was only one year and he went on to have me and I wasn't raised in the Adventist church and neither was my mom who was not raised in the Adventist church and yet she had one year of Adventist Academy her senior year of high school. And my dad had one year in Walla Walla College. And so when it came time for me to go to high school, my mom sought out an Adventist Academy and I got to go for those four years to Auburn Adventist Academy. During this whole time, my dad would have periods where he felt drawn back, but he didn't make that decision. But fast forward to 2002 and 2003, I've already graduated and I'm actively serving as a pastor during that time. But my dad came back to church. My dad found a church home. During the 70s when he was there in Germany and in Walla Walla College, there was something, some memory of the experience, that warmth of that table and that Bible study circle and those experiences that he had had that he wanted to have again. 
So he found a church right outside Portland where he was living in the Oregon Conference Pleasant Valley Church. They had authentic community, they had connection with God, and they had this call to service. There was a Sabbath school to which he belonged and a homeless ministry that they went to cook downtown and he knew that he could be a part of it. And he just got so excited about how they were serving, the discussions they would have and how it was causing his faith to grow. And he started to talk about all of this. And we didn't realize at the time that it would be just less than two years from that point when he would be diagnosed with a rare aggressive cancer. My dad fought and my dad lived. We have memories together during those two years when it could have been just six months that he had. God gave us two years. And when we lost him in 2007, when he was 54 years old, he had a church community. He asked me to preach and lead the service, which was incredibly challenging for me. But there was a group of people that surrounded me and who sustained with their support, his Sabbath school group, his church community. In those days around the memorial service, they helped with preparing such a special time to remember my dad. And as I planned the service and as I preached that service, they took care of so many details and rose up to love us well during that time. My dad and I talked about God's mercy and drawing him back when he did. You see, he said he would always question if he had come back after getting cancer. If he had come back after the diagnosis, he would have wondered if it was authentic. But God drew his heart back to God and to the church before he was diagnosed. So he had a completely different perspective and different support through his cancer journey because God had led him back. And he found church and he found calling. He found that kind of experience that he had been longing for. And I will be forever grateful for those people and for how they did life together. Remember the prodigal son? Remember he returned because of an image of home? What am I doing here? In my father's house, they have food, they're together, they're connected. Let's make sure people have something to go back to. Home food, work, family, nourishment, purpose, and community. See if we can just think about our discipleship in those ways, those core things, God, community, and purpose, service, head, heart, hands. That's what he realized he was without. My dad, as well as the prodigal son, knew I need something more in my life because they had experienced it. So he came back. I would hope that when we reinstate those who are back, that we say we love them and we declare that they love Jesus and that Jesus loves them, but that we all also trust them to be a part of the work again. Just like the father who puts the robe on and the ring on his finger signifying authority and decisions again, that then my, my dad, who was invited to serve again, and Peter, who was invited, feed, shepherd, care for my sheep, that we would also invite those who come back into purpose and those who are still there. Back to the statistical data for a moment. We must reduce our losses and see an increase in those who are joining sessions by baptism and profession of faith. At the end of the whole presentation, Dr. Trim asked two questions. I'll, I'll share one with you. Are we giving our local church members collective training in holistic disciple making? To him, he defines holistic disciple making as nurturing and retaining members, motivating and equipping them to share Jesus. And I couldn't agree more. It's always been both. Follow me and I'll teach you how to fish for people. The calling is to both, to follow and be with Jesus and join him in what he's doing in the world. That's what we're called to. So I want you to think about your discipleship program. Is there head, hands, and heart? Is there God, community, and purpose? This is what it looks like to lead others to discipleship. 
There's a story often told, it's, it's told in motivational speeches and books. Uh, this story made it far and wide. I'll tell you first how it's told, and then I'll tell you how it really happened. The Special Olympics summer event was held in Seattle in 1976. I was raised in Seattle. I love this story. But nine, con nine contestants with disabilities are lined up ready to run the 100-yard dash. The starting gun sounds off, and one boy stumbles and falls at the start. He scrapes his knee, and he begins to howl. All of the other eight contestants turn and whip around to see what's happening. No adult steps in. They just turn to see. They all then, the story is told, come back to the boy. They hug him, they give him kisses, and they rise up and they all link arms and they walk across the finish line together. Too good to be true? Turns out it is, actually. The other eight did not all come back. This is, however, real life. You know that not everybody comes back. Your heart aches that not everybody comes back. Not everybody finds safety. So let's be honest here for a moment. There's real pain. There are real scraped knees. There are times when no one notices. There are times when people are crying alone. There are times that we just look around for hope. But you see, what actually happened gives me that hope. Not all came back. But two did. Two turned around and noticed and they came back. That's why the story got, got extrapolated from there because two contestants took one side and the other took the other side and they held him up and made sure that he crossed the finish line with them. Perhaps this week, perhaps this month, perhaps this year, you'll be the one to notice. Not all will turn back, but maybe you will be one who does. Maybe you will be one who notices the pain of someone else, who notices the purposelessness of someone else, who notices someone who longs for community, and you'll link arms with them, and you'll walk with them on this slow and steady journey of discipleship, and you'll make sure, together by the grace of God, that we walk across the finish line together. You can be the one who disciples someone holistically by the grace of God, even as you are being discipled yourself. See, it's a lifelong journey for us as well as for the others in our lives. The calling to love Jesus and to join Jesus in his work in the world. Will you be one who turns back?